thanks for those of you who are in the talk. Um, so this session was originally titled, Can Open Source and Corporate Interests Merge in the Cloud? Uh, but I've renamed it to this. Can open source and cl cloud vendors coexist in peace and harmony? Uh, it's mostly about uh, open source infrastructure software vendors. So think databases, mess messaging systems, CICD, deployment testing, cluster scheduling, and a whole lot more. Basically, it's the suite of software tools that developers use to create and deliver applications and services to their end users. So uh, this is based on my experience building a business around the open source time series database in FluxDB. So I started InfluxDB the project and I started a company called Influx Data uh, around that has been basically turning this into a business. So I'll talk more about that in the latter half of this talk, but in the beginning, I wanted to talk about what we've seen in the industry over time. So, uh, so three and a half years ago, I think it was like April of uh, 2017, uh, I gave a talk at another conference uh, and the talk was titled, the open source database business model is under siege. Uh, and basically the idea was uh, that, that the, the open source businesses and open source vendors, they were under siege by cloud vendors and specifically uh, the cloud service providers, AWS, GCP and Azure. And in that, in that talk, I laid out uh, different open source business models. Uh, so this, these are like the, the business models that I came to that open source vendors would traditionally use. Uh, consulting professional services, support subscriptions, OEM, uh, closed source production tooling and monitoring, open core, where you ship a proprietary forked version of the open source, and then finally software as a service. Now, uh, I think the models in the red are really the only legitimate ones uh, and they're mainly the ones that are being impacted the most by the cloud vendors, right? If you're paying for a cloud vendors managed service, you don't need uh, support or production tooling and monitoring. You just get that from the cloud vendor themselves. So I gave that talk in 2017 uh, and I thought it'd be interesting to, to see how things have played out in that time, in the time since that. Uh, so I went through and I dug up like some blog posts from some of the big uh, open source vendors uh, and let's take a look at what happened. So these are kind of like roughly in chronological order. In February of 2018, Elastic had this blog post from Shy called Doubling Down on Open. Um, and while it's saying they're doubling down on open, what they were doing is they're taking some projects that were previously closed source and they were rolling them into the Elastic source open source repo, but they were doing that under a totally new license called the Elastic Community License, uh, which ostensibly was trying to limit uh, what cloud vendors could do with the software. Basically what anybody who would use the Elastic software to create a service might be able to do. And they were going to release more and more software basically under this community license was the idea. Soon after, Redis Labs, uh, you know, the big vendor behind that has been supporting uh, Redis, uh, came out with an announcement that uh, there they ha would have extensions to Redis that would be licensed under their own community license. And then there was this big uproar in the community. And then uh, the co-founder and CTO came out with this post about Redis's core still being a permissive three clause BSD license, uh, and that will continue to be so. But the, the, the truth here is the real news of the story was that Redis Labs was going to put more and more software, not under an open source license, but instead under a restricted community license that doesn't qualify as open source. MongoDB uh, famously switched their license from AGPL or uh, yeah, AGPLv3 to um, to uh, a license called the SSPL. They were trying to get it admitted into the open source initiative and that did not succeed. This was in October of 2018. Confluent, the company behind Kafka also made their own announcements. Announcements. Uh, so this is in December of 2018. Uh, so they were basically coming out with their own community license and they would be releasing uh, a bunch of new software under that license and not under an open source license. Uh, 
So the thing that basically happened is that the biggest open source vendors actually pivoted to the point where they're no longer open source. They went either closed source or they went source available. And the funny thing is the blog post that each of them wrote kind of put themselves forward as being open, but what they were fundamentally doing was they were being less open. They were going away from open source licenses. Um, you know, as, as Tyler Durden and Fight Club said, uh, sticking feathers up your butt doesn't make you a chicken. Just because you claim it's open source doesn't mean it is. Just because people can see the source code does not make it open source. Source available is not open source. It just means other people can see that code. So let's look at what the, what the cloud vendors did. And specifically, we're going to look at Amazon. Um, so in 2019, you know, there was, a, there was a flurry of activity around each one of these projects, right? So first on, in January of 2019, Amazon announced DocumentDB with MongoDB compatibility. So it's basically their closed source offering, but it is compatible with the MongoDB API. Uh, so then they also announced in, what was it, in March of 2019, uh, they have the open distro for Elasticsearch, which they claim is not a fork of Elastic, but basically they're creating a new distribution. They're gathering new code around it. They say they'll do upstream you know, pushes of code, but they're essentially forking Elasticsearch. They're potentially forking the community as well as the code base itself. But all the code they're releasing is actually under an Apache 2 license. So their title to this blog post, keeping open source open actually rings true to me because that's actually what they're doing. Um, so in May of 2019, uh, AWS launched basically Kafka compatibility for messaging, their messaging service. Uh, so again, they're taking a popular open source project, at least the API of that thing, and they're releasing a service that is API compatible that's based on a closed source SaaS offering. Uh, and then uh, AWS announced Elastic Cache for Redis with high availability. So this is basically the Redis clustering bits, but offered up uh, in AWS as a service. They had already been offering Redis as a service for a while, but now offering these clustering bits as a service is more and more of a competition with Redis Labs, the primary vendor behind Redis. So the, the interesting things I think about those open source vendors announcements and Amazon's announcement is that they were both about being more open. AWS's message was also about being more open. And even though I'm in the open source vendor camp, if I'm being critical and honest about things, Amazon's argument feels more correct to me. They're offering services based on open APIs and open software. If you're one of the open source vendors, in one sense, you kind of put your community and the cloud vendors in a united front against you. Both the cloud vendors and the users want openness and freedom in their software and open source vendors coming out with community licenses are basically limiting that freedom. Open source to me is ultimately, it's about freedom. So let me talk about what developers like about open source and why I think open source is really about freedom. So first, is the ability to reuse that code in new projects. If you have permissive open source licenses, you don't even have to take a project wholesale. You can just take libraries from that project or bits from that project that you think are good, use them in a new project, right? Postgres is a great example. Like the Postgres parser and different parts of the Postgres code base have been used in countless other derivative database projects, some of which have been open, some of which have been closed and commercial, uh, it's all over the place. So I think that code reuse in other new projects unrelated to the original open source project is a really powerful thing. Obviously there's the ability to fork existing projects. If you as a user or a developer don't like where a project is going or you don't like what somebody's doing with it or what some other vendor is doing with it, if you have freedom, you can fork that project, you can develop your own version of it based off that fork, you can create something new completely, like derivative works, essentially. It doesn't stop that from happening. I think the other thing about open source projects that I like is that the APIs are basically open. And the nice thing is if these things become popular, they become kind of de facto standards. 
And that means you can take this with you across different cloud vendors because you can use the software in different cloud vendors. You can take it with you across different jobs, right? If, if open source has wide adoption, if a project has wide adoption, there are many, many companies that will use that software and you can change jobs and use that skill set. And ultimately you can build a business or a service for other developers to use. And it's this last bullet point that I think is actually more important than anything else by a wide margin. If people can use software to enrich themselves, it will become much more popular. It will drive all sorts of activity outside of the software. In fact, this to me is the very definition of a platform. A platform is only that if the economic activity that surrounds it outstrips the value captured by any single vendor. Developers like platforms, particularly popular ones, because they can build their careers on them. Their expertise in, popular, in a popular platform translates to opportunities and better pay and basically a more secure life. So developers demand this kind of freedom, right? Limit, limiting the freedom means fewer developers will build their business on your software. In addition to demanding freedom, developers demand value convenience, which is why cloud services based on popular open source APIs get so much traction. The cloud vendor response to all of this has been entirely predictable. What, they, what they're gonna do is they're gonna do what their customers are asking them to do, which is provide them with managed services based on open APIs. Open source SaaS is basically the marriage of freedom and convenience. And the cloud vendors are just going where their customers are telling them to go. So ultimately, infrastructure software is becoming a commodity. And this, you know, part of this is the economics of cloud vendors. Basically, cloud vendors make absolutely great margins on network, compute, and storage. It's because they can buy this hardware and operate it and deploy it at scale. So they get it at better price, they get better economies of scale than anybody on the planet. Infrastructure software basically just drives more usage for those underlying resources. I think one example of this is evidenced by Google trying to basically commoditize the entire like cloud platform API by coming out with Kubernetes, open sourcing it, and then releasing it into a foundation which Ostensibly, they do not control. There are a bunch of other vendors involved in that foundation. So in response to, I think, the open source vendors having more community licenses and more restrictive licenses, my prediction is that source available projects will have significant open source competition in the coming years. So basically, all those vendors I was just talking about, those projects will have significant open source competitors I'd say within the next five years. It doesn't mean they won't be, continue to be successful. I'm just saying other projects will arise. And the truth is, if other developers and other companies don't do this, the cloud vendors will, because they'll do anything to drive the adoption of their underlying compute, storage, and network resources. So here's how it played out for us. Basically, what, what we did, so in 2016, uh, InfluxDB was basically completely open source. And what we announced was that uh, future versions would have high availability and, close, and, and clustering as closed source software. Basically, that was going to be a commercial offering that we would offer, that we would have. So basically, we became an open core company. So we forked the open source project and created a commercial version of it. Now, this was definitely the right decision for us at that time. We needed a way to turn you know, the popularity of our open source project into a business, uh, which we didn't have at that point. And that move basically created significant like commercial uptake right away, right? So while we basically had commercial success in those three and a half years. But at the same time, I would say there have been more competing projects that have come out because we've done you know, less of our code out in the open. And I think we've ultimately gotten less adoption for InfluxDB than we otherwise would have had. So what makes me say we got less adoption? I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of InfluxDB servers that we know of that are running around the world. And to many people that would sound like a very successful open source project. However, if I'm being intellectually honest, there's something that I would have expected to see that hasn't yet happened. 
if InfluxDB were really, really popular. And that's how I would have expected to see hosted competition. I would have expected to see AWS offer InfluxDB as a hosted service to their customers and then Google and Azure and everybody else to follow suit. And that we haven't seen that. Largely, we as a vendor are the ones who are offering hosted InfluxDB. Now, there are other bits of the platform that the open source, that the cloud vendors have adopted, but not the core of the database itself. So going to the, the, the platform, the open source and the SaaS try, trying to tile these things together, basically in this new environment, I think SaaS is really the only real option for open source infrastructure vendors. Support subscriptions, closed source production monitoring, tooling, those things are for on-premise customers. And that business is in structural decline. And for those who still go with it, they're likely going to want to own and operate those things themselves and build their own expertise in-house on that open source software. So really like SaaS, I think is the only option that you have as a vendor. And what that means is you need to have significant closed source software in your SaaS solution that provides you with some sort of competitive differentiation. So for our part, we've spent the last two years building out an open source cloud product. This is basically the new version of InfluxDB version 2.0. It's available in all three major clouds. However, the open source bits are actually completely separate from the cloud service. There are some libraries that are shared between the two, but our open source InfluxDB2 project is very separate and very different from the cloud product that we offer. And I actually think this is less than ideal. I think in an ideal scenario, uh, you'd be running your open source bits in production, you, you, which means you'd find and fix bugs, you'd fix performance regressions and you'd make improvements. And generally you build more, build more reliable open source software over time as your SaaS product matured. So this is my, my next prediction, which is that I think SaaS infrastructure projects with open APIs and open source exhaust will be the future business model of open source vendors. Uh, and people with source available licenses, I do not consider them to be open source vendors anymore, even if they had their roots in open source. And this is this has already started to happen. Like many people are already starting to abandon the open premise on sorry on premise managed by the customer models. What they're doing is they're creating open source software as the exhaust of basically essentially creating a SaaS product that they offer, and in the course of like creating that product, they open source bits of it that they think they can open source that other people might be able to use yet they'd still withhold some sort of value in the SaaS offering. So basically I think it's gonna be SaaS first, open source exhaust after that. And the open source software will basically only be valuable to the vendor, the open source vendor, if it drives visibility for them. And ultimately if it drives adoption of their API and the API adoption will actually only happen if that software is actually open source, but also if the open source thing is useful, it has to ultimately be useful on its own for people to want to adopt it. So what will the cloud vendors do? They'll do what their customers are asking for, right? They're going to deliver managed services based on open source and popular APIs. If you don't want them using your source code, don't open source it. However, if an API is popular enough, they'll look to offer a competing version of it, even if it's not open source, because that's what their customers are asking for. So what that means is if you're producing an infrastructure tool, whether you're open source or not, you almost have to produce it for each cloud vendor, at least each of the major cloud ven vendors. Otherwise you risk having one or more of them produce the same thing and potentially open source it to make it a commodity. So really, I guess one of the main question here is like, will cloud service providers and open source vendors collaborate? And, you know, they're already doing this at the edges. 
So for example, we have a data collector called Telegraph. Uh, it's a very popular open source project that we, that we make. Uh, and it actually lie, it's uh, an entity that's kind of separate from the other parts of our stack. Uh, and we've actually already taken contributions and collaborated with Microsoft, and we're now working with AWS to try and bring in some of their contributions, uh, which essentially means that Telegraph can be used uh, with AWS, even in cases where AWS is providing a competing service to what we're doing. And the reason we're doing that is because we want this open source project to be successful, and we want it to have broad adoption because we think that broad adoption will be help beneficial you know, for us in addition to the cloud vendors. And I think Kubernetes is kind of like a great example of this, right? Like all the cloud vendors are actually contributing to it. And I would think, I think maybe Google benefits a bit more because they probably have the best, most mature cloud offering of Kubernetes, but they're still collaborating on this. And ultimately I think developers win because you get an open API that's available across clouds. So, but the, then the other thing is like, if your service is driving a bunch of usage, they may want to partner. And Google and Azure in particular seem to have been doing this more and more with, with other vendors, but I think AWS is also doing this as well. But all of this basically means that you have to provide a first class SaaS service, a first class service on the different clouds. Any gaps that you have in your service will lead to their users and their customers asking for those features directly from the cloud vendors who will be more than happy to deliver that software to them if enough people are asking. So for us, like I said, we've spent the last few years developing like this, this SaaS product. Um, and we've also been doing open source along the way, but the core open source database uh, experience has not evolved as much as our cloud platform by far. So um, essentially for our future open source development, we're, we're going to try and bend even more of it to this strategy. So we have a new project that we're gonna be, that I'm gonna be announcing on November 10th. Um, but the idea is this new project uh, will be open source but we're going to offer it as a SaaS product as well. Now this open source project will be dual licensed under MIT and Apache 2. So a permissive open source license that provides all those freedoms I was talking about. It will be a complete and useful project on its own. Uh, at least that's what we're hoping for. Um, but ultimately this project will require more code and other services and stuff like that, if you wanted to operate it as a cloud service, either on your own or as a company providing it to customers. And one of the things uh, we did with this project is we wanted the architecture of the software to mirror the business goals of the, of the, the project itself. So what that means is the, the software is actually made of multiple different pieces. One of these pieces is open source and some of these other pieces are closed source and that's by design, right? The separation of concerns is actually part of the infrastructure software design, but it also mirrors the business design. And one of the things that we really wanted was we wanted to run the open source bits as is in the commercial SaaS platform. So what that means is those open source bits are actually just exhaust. Like these are things that we would have had to build, build anyway to deliver the SaaS platform that we want to deliver. And the fact that we can open source them is, is a bonus. So what that means is if this new project is successful, which I would expect to take time for it to build up that success, uh, I would ultimately expect to see competitors adopt that software and use it in their SaaS products. And that's by design. However, those competitors will be doing it probably long after we've already been doing it because most people don't want to adopt and base their business off of a brand new project. So they'll only be doing it once the software has already been proven popular and proven successful, and we've been running a SaaS product behind it for a while. So let's get back to those other vendors. Is this competition actually harming those vendors that were previously open source, right? The vast majority of their communities were built while what they had was essentially pure open source software, right? 
and then some enterprise offerings and stuff like that, but they still had the open source core. Uh, but then they got the hosted competition through the cloud vendors. So only two of these companies are publicly traded at this point. And I use this kind of like as a proxy for whether or not they've been harmed. So this is Elastic's stock price since they went public, which you can see is kind of a roller coaster. But ultimately, like if you had invested in the IPO, uh, you know, what was this a uh, couple of years ago, you'd be at like 1.8, depending on the exact timing of when you put in and when you took out. So not too bad, uh, given just a couple of years. So it seems that Elastic is still continuing to thrive, despite the fact that they're getting this competition. And here's MongoDB. So their, obviously their license was HTPL beforehand, and then they switched to this new license. But if you had put money into MongoDB back when they IPO'd, it was this like three short years ago, you'd be at uh, nearly five times your money almost. So ultimately I think the important thing to note about open source is that it's not a zero sum game. Having the cloud vendors adopt open source and particularly use the, the project names and use the APIs as part of their services kind of expands the size of the community and expands the user base of that open source software. And for infrastructure software, that's really the most important thing is that you get that broad adoption so the developers can feel comfortable building expertise on those things so that they can then go work with that software professionally. That's all I have. Thank you.